Marilyn Monroe, alien hybrids, and whatever the hell this is. American Horror Story's second Death Valley episode has dropped, and it is a marked improvement over the first, filled with even more clues as to what's going on, including how Death Valley and Red Tide are linked. We're not going to be wasting any time, there's a lot to cover here, so make sure to hit that like and subscribe button, because here we go. We're in Palm Springs, 1963, nine years after the events of last episode, which saw President Dwight Eisenhower come into contact with both an alien entity and the long-missing Amelia Earhart. Eisenhower is no longer president, and his former vice president, Richard Nixon, is sweating it out because he fears current president, John F. Kennedy, will find out about the secret treaty they made with the aliens. The sweating Dick Nixon, and yes, I never thought I'd say sweating Dick, is a reference to Richard Nixon's debate against Kennedy in 1960, which was the first televised debate ever, and saw Nixon sweating profusely due to the hot camera light and improper makeup. It's actually considered one of the main things that lost Nixon the election. Nixon doesn't trust Kennedy. He's a Catholic and Democrat, which he has disdain for. But as Mamie Eisenhower will later reveal, Nixon has ulterior motives. He wants to become president. And if Ike is labeled as some sort of traitor with the fact he made a deal with aliens that sacrificed American lives, well, you can believe he'd never stand a chance at being president. So Eisenhower and Nixon decide to get ahead of things and speak with the president president directly, showing him confidential papers about the crash in 54. Now there's some really cool information if you read part of the confidential dossier found here. It talks about a colony established only by males. It also uses the word Adam and Eve plus a mention of God. The whole thing kind of hints that we're not the descendants of God, but of aliens, which could be why Eisenhower, who usually started his meetings with a prayer, decides not to, saying, that's when we had something to pray to. The basics of this alien treaty are as follows. In exchange for 5,000 abductions a year, the American government will be given access to advanced tech, allowing them to dominate the world. We see some of this tech later on in the episode. Subject 1, also known as Maria, shows them a device which can triple the speed of electronic devices and a metal box made from material that can't be picked up by radar. Mamie Eisenhower even remarks how great their Salisbury microwave dinner was and it heated up in only 30 seconds. Some of you may have even noticed the movie playing on screen, Space Master X7, which ironically was billed as a double feature alongside Vincent Price's The Fly. President Kennedy expresses his concerns to Marilyn Monroe, who he was having an affair with, but Monroe died in 1962, and this is set in 1963. Is this merely a writer's error, or is something else going on here? Amelia Earhart returned, not having aged a day since her disappearance in 1937 and we'll later meet Calico, who hasn't aged a day since the 60s. Perhaps this is all connected. Well, Marilyn doesn't seem too concerned about the aliens. As a child, she had an experience where a teddy bear was beamed down to her bedroom. She had no idea where it came from. In past preview footage, we've seen Marilyn visited by aliens, so there is some sort of connection here. But the fact Marilyn wants Kennedy to tell the American people the truth hints that she's not in cahoots with whatever entity took control of Subject 1. We go back nine years to 1954, where Eisenhower is president. He's convened a meeting with top military advisors on what to do about this treaty. On the one hand, they are surrendering their sovereignty, but on the other, they risk the aliens going to Russia should they not accept. They're interrupted by Subject 1, who tells them that the alien world is dying, but we never find out what it's dying from, which I think is very interesting. They need to abduct humans and create some sort of hybrid, since the aliens haven't evolved to combat our planet's toxic and viruses. Their test subject was Amelia Earhart, and as we'll see later, that didn't really pan out. So the aliens need more candidates. Whatever entity is controlling subject one explodes her own head after he or she is done with it. But before this happens, we get a small glimpse at the entity's real voice, just like we did in the last episode. Time is running out. For both our people. I don't know about you guys, but I'm putting my money on Cody Fern being the person controlling these people. We know he's been cast this season, and according to Wikipedia, and yes, Wikipedia isn't a reliable source, he may be playing Valiant Thor, an alien who represented an intergalactic high council who regularly met with Eisenhower. You can see an uncanny resemblance between Fern in the preview footage and this shot of Thor. Eisenhower expresses his concerns about the treaty to his wife Mamie, whose only big concern at the moment is 
organizing her birthday. And yes, her big birthday celebrations covered by the media help popularize birthday celebrations amongst American adults. Mimi really wants Ike to accept the treaty, and that's because, as we'll see in a bit, she's being controlled by the aliens. So Eisenhower's eventual acceptance of this treaty is coerced, seeing as the alien would have killed Mimi should he not have accepted. Mimi even goes behind Ike's back, asking Nixon to convince Eisenhower to take the deal. Nixon even proposes they could accept the deal, then use the alien tech against them to force them back. Not sure if that plotline is where the show is headed. Now I gotta say the present day segment in this episode was a lot better than last week's. Our four pregnant friends are on their way to see Jamie's doctor, Dr. Ryas, the same doctor she's had since she was 19, and she says this doctor is discreet. Remember last episode it was hinted that Jamie may have had an abortion when she was 19, so it makes sense they go to someone who is discreet in case they all need to get rid of this alien inside of them. Things take a turn when the doctor finds two heartbeats. It could mean twins, but on the ultrasound we really only see one alien-like creature. Could the ultrasound just be picking up one, or could the alien have two hearts? And what is this weird floating thing? The appointment is cut short when a bunch of literal men in black storm the office and abduct our gang of four. They're injected with this green laser thing which knocks them unconscious. This is likely tech from the aliens. Kendall wakes up attached to this weird advice, floating in a room with other pregnant people. I guess in last week's preview footage they hadn't completed the VFX yet, as you can see the boards they're laying on. We get our first glimpse of Angelica Ross's character Theta, who seems to be a half-human, half-alien hybrid. She tells Kendall that the thing inside her is hope for the future and an opportunity to save a planet. Kendall is put back to sleep, seemingly via mind control or whatever it is she's connected to. We're then introduced to this white cafeteria area where nutritious jelly cubes are brought out, giving me total apocalypse vibes. Now this is supposed to be present day, yet Steve Jobs is here. Steve Jobs died in 2011. Does this have something to do with time, as I previously mentioned, or is Death Valley completely fiction? Steve is talking to Leslie Grossman's character, Calico. It's heavily implied that Steve is one of these alien hybrids as he shows his disdain for other such hybrids who squander their talents. He talks about one of them using a pencil, which he doesn't like since he probably prefers digital. And Calico even says she once saw one of the hybrids use their talents for shooting ping pong balls out of their... Well, you know. That's actually a nod to season 4's Freak Show, where Desiree Dupree said the same thing to Elsa Mars. So it seems as though these hybrids are talented. And we get this really quick shot of a man administering what seems to be black pills to our abductees. Is there something these pills react to when combined with an alien fetus? Something that makes them talented, like how we saw the pill create talented people in Red Tide? The other interesting thing here is Calico's claim that she hasn't aged a day since she got here, likely in the 1960s. She's not a quote one and done and they appear to keep her around for breeding purposes which begs the question what happens to those who are one and done are they killed or are they brought back to earth with no memory of what happened but i want to get back to this aging thing calico hasn't aged and what was the last line the chemist says to baby eli at the end of red tide we're gonna move on to another place create another drug Maybe one that'll make you and I live forever. That she might go and make a pill so that they can live forever. The pill has been used in promo material as the thing that bridges Red Tide and Death Valley together, and I can't help but think something much bigger is going on here. After Troy refuses to take the pills, he's brought in to meet Theta. His concern is where does the baby come out of? Will it be his mouth, his stomach, or someplace far more painful? Theta says the line, life must find its own way, which is very similar to Jeff Goldblum's line in Jurassic Park, Life finds a way. Jeff Goldblum starred in the 1986 version of The Fly, which the double feature Mamie and Ike were watching, was based on. Lots of cool little Easter eggs like that throughout the episode. Later today, I hope to be coming out with the episode 9 preview breakdown. Yes, we only have two more episodes of this season, so I hope you'll stick around for that. But I also want to hear your thoughts and theories below on what could happen next. Thanks for watching, everyone. Make sure to like and subscribe, and for more bad takes, you can always follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much.